Welcome to the Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch and I have a really interesting session for you today. So today's episode will be an exciting episode because we have Brian Clayton as our guest and yeah. The business had he started some time ago, yes, Greenpal, that has been called the Uber of the Lawn Care. Yeah, and who did that? Well, Entrepreneur Magazine called his business Greenpal the Uber for Lawn Care. And he has already in his business over 100,000 active users completing thousands of transactions per day, which is awesome. So today's topic will be uh, segmented in three key questions that I'm going to ask um, Brian. So we're starting with after having found two highly successful businesses and sold uh, your first one, what do you think is the most important element of small business growth? My second question to Brian is when you look at bootstrapping businesses, from zero to profitability, what are the necessary steps to achieve that? And I finalize that with my third and most important question based on the other things that we've heard from him. With the current volatility in the market, what do you see as an effective marketing strategy for small, medium-sized enterprises now so i've got today with me brian clayton and uh as far as i understood you've been uh, or your business has been called the uber of lawn care according to uh, entrepreneur magazine so brian can you maybe tell us some some more about yourself and your business yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. I've never had a job. I've always owned my own businesses. I, I started mowing lawns when I was in high school. My dad forced me to, to cut my first yard, uh, the neighbor's yard one day. And ever since then, I just had a love for owning my own businesses and, and, and kind of setting my own destiny. And uh, I grew my first business from just myself and a push mower over 15 years to 150 employees and $10 million a year in, in annual revenue. And in 2013, that business was acquired by the largest uh, landscaping company in the United States. And after that, I kind of retired and took some time off and I started my second business, which is called Green Pal, which is kind of like the Uber, but for lawn mowing. So if a homeowner needs to get this chore done, uh, get, get the lawn mowed, yard maintenance done, they can jump on the Green Pal website or the app and hire somebody in less than 60 seconds. And been doing that for six years. And we've grown that business, my two co-founders and I, from zero revenue to this year, we're going to do $20 million in, in annual recurring revenue and, and bootstrapped both businesses from, from zero to, to, to where they are now. And so uh, I've got some experience on, on starting a traditional type of business, a blue collar business, and then, and then making the, the shift to a, tr to a technology driven business. And uh, I've seen it kind of from both angles and, and I love it. I love being in business for myself. It's, it's part of uh, what makes, brings me joy and, and it's part of the, the drive the, for my own personal growth. Uh, and uh, I, I'm loving what I'm doing now. And, and hope to be doing it for 10 years from now. Okay, so after having founded two highly successful businesses and sold your first business, as you mentioned just now, what do you think is the most important element of small business growth? Well, it just it, it shifts as, as you go through the journey of starting a business. So in the early days, you know, that's the hardest part is that first year is, is going from uh, what Peter Thiel calls from zero to one, which is basically you have nothing. Uh, well, it might just be an idea. It may be a prototype. It may just it may be uh, a, a business that you want to start. You don't have anything to work with and you have to you have to literally birth that and take it to something of substance. And so that to me, that is the hardest part of, of starting a business in the first year, two years. 
uh, I attribute a lot of my successes to just sheer grit. Uh, Mark Cuban says the least amount of money it takes you to live on, the greater your options. And for me, that's always been an ethos for me in, in starting and building my businesses is, is just trying to, trying to survive on the least amount of money it took to live personally and in the business and bootstrap the business from the revenue that it grew. And in the early days, it's extremely hard because you know your revenue might, might just be a trickle and you have to literally take that and invest it as best you can. And over time, you start to realize that the benefits of compound interest you know, your first year revenue may, may be 10 or 20 or $50,000. And, and, uh, but if you can continue to double that year over year, if you look back three or five years, you actually have something. And so for me, starting and, and growing my businesses, both have been bootstrapped. I haven't taken on any outside capital. The, the one thing that has gotten me and my co-founders where we are today is just sheer grit, sheer hustle, uh, just a relentless focus on the customer and and constant improvement on the product and and reinvesting the money that the that the business generated into growth and and into improvement and into things that would cause the business to grow as simple as those things sound they're hard to do because when you're when you're starting a business you're you're inundated with a million different things you can focus on and you have to really distill that into the one or two or three things that that will move the needle for you that will drive the business forward and, and that's something that even to this day, 20 years into starting building and selling businesses, I still have to remind myself every day that, that I have to, I can only control a certain number of things and I have to act in that circle. Um, and one of my favorite books is, is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the author of that book, Stephen Covey, talks about you have your, your circle of concern and that is everything that concerns you. It could be, you know, the marketplace. It could be your uh, your customers. It could be, uh, you know, like today, right now, we're dealing with COVID. That's in your circus circle of concern, and then a much smaller circle inside of that is your circle of influence. And those are the things you can actually control. It's the things that you're doing on a day to day basis to to move the business forward. And you have to really, you have to be aware of the circle of concern, but you have to act inside of that circle of influence. And the more you act inside that circle of influence, the greater it and bigger it gets. And that simple little little heuristic is one thing that's helped me build successful businesses. It's just constantly living in that circle of of influence to where I can I can move the needle forward and drive the business forward. Okay, um, yeah, it makes definitely makes sense uh, for me too. I've seen it in business as well that way, uh, especially when you say, okay, the main you have to really. Keep your costs low and uh, don't go crazy. Like even if you've got a big deal and suddenly big cash flow coming in, like getting your Ferrari, Lamborghini, or whatever. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain <Yeah. laughs> things you might say. Okay, it's worth having because you can save time and you've got the ability to reach. Because, for instance, nowadays when you look at what's happening now, um, if you want to fly from ten uh, from uh, from where you are based in uh, what's the place Nashville, uh, Tennessee. Based? Home of Nashville, Kentucky. Tennessee. Yeah, so it's really nice in the middle center. And uh, from there, really, you can go anywhere. But of course, if you want to take, it, uh, take a plane now at the moment, it might not be as convenient. Um, <laughs> Very true. You have to commute. Or if you've got your own license or your own plane and have somebody who can fly it for you, at least you don't have to fly with the big uh, airlines. Very true. You just hop out and you haven't got the risk of the, what we've got now where you don't know whether you can catch something and yeah. you want to limit of course your own exposure because uh, you as the head of of the person and even if you've got co-founders uh what your business is doing at the moment it's all happening in your head because you're the the driving motive we're getting absolutely it. yeah and that brings me actually really to to my second question um because that's when you look at bootstrapping as you mentioned bootstrapping a business from zero revenue to profitability especially when i think you just said before 20 million revenue for your business in six years that's a great number um so what are actually the necessary steps to achieve that in a business yeah so i'm I, a lot of people ask me if i do some coaching for for small business owners and entrepreneurs here in nashville and i get the question a lot should i raise money or should i not raise money which is which is the right answer and which is the wrong answer? And the the truth is both both can 
are, are the right answer. And it just depends. For, for me, I personally believe that raising outside capital, whether it be from angel investors or venture capital, for most entrepreneurs is a bad bet. A lot of those businesses, it's either it's, 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 it's a binary outcome. Either it's a huge, successful, $100 million, billion dollar outcome, or it's a zero. And as an entrepreneur, you have one, one bet to make, but the investor has 10, 20, 30 bets that, that, that they're making. And so it's, it's a kind of an all or nothing outcome. And when it works, it's a beautiful thing. And you read about it in the, in the tech press or you read about it in the Wall Street Journal and, and, you, and you, you fall in love with that story. However, the reality is it, the, the chances of becoming one of those are, are extremely outsized. And so it's, 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 a, it's usually a long shot bet for most entrepreneurs. That said, um, if you're going to raise outside capital, you need to be aware of, of, of how that game is played. And you really need to understand it before you do it, because most entrepreneurs don't. For me, I have decided, you know, my first business, I, I built debt free off of its own revenues. My second business, the same, the same path. And for me, it's always just been a better bet to, to, to be what I call default alive. No matter what happens, the, re- the business is profitable and, and we will survive no matter what the case be. You know, and, and right now, going through this downturn with COVID, no, our business is actually growing and we are never, haven't been concerned with going out of business like most, most other companies because we don't have, oh, we're not over leveraged. We don't have investors uh, causing us to make uh, unrealistic decisions. We, don't, we, we are in charge of our own path forward. And so that's my personal philosophy. That said, if you're going to bootstrap your own business, you're, you and your business have to be one of the same, in my opinion. Uh, you personally are going to need to live on as, the least amount of money that you can personally live off of uh, because you're going to need to reinvest every dime that that business makes back into it to help fuel its growth. I had one uh, uh, new entrepreneur that I was coaching the other day, and he, and 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 he he was saying, you know, I've got I've got a wife, kids, I've I've been through a divorce. Uh, I have to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just to survive. And I'm and I'm thinking to myself, um, you know, unless you just knock it out of the park on the first swing, it's going to be hard for you to make it because that's a lot of money that you're going to have to pull out of your business. You really need to live on fifty thousand a year and invest the other two hundred into its growth. Unless you're unless you're on your second trip and you've already sold a business or two, and investors are willing to throw money at you, you know you're going to need to take a little hard look at your own personal finances before you start a, a business and get those in shape first before you start that company that you plan on bootstrapping. Everything I've just said has really nothing to do with growing a business. It has everything to do with your own personal uh, finances, but it's a lot of it's it's something that's often overlooked. Uh, and that, and I think it's one of the most important things for any business owner or entrepreneur to, to take inventory of before they quit their job that's paying them 250 grand or 100 grand or 75 grand to understand that they're going to need to live on rice and beans for the first year, two years if they plan on bootstrapping that business. I absolutely agree because one of my businesses that I once founded in the UK, uh, there was a time when I used to uh, live off uh, macarons from um, what called uh, macarons from a can, and that was twenty three pence. Absolutely, and you know, <laughs> yeah, but it's possible. Uh, it's it absolutely yeah. is, and you're not going to do it for years, but you somehow find ways, and and yeah. Well, and and in my country, in the United States. We have, you know, we're, we have a lot of immigrants that come here that start successful businesses, whether it be Indian entrepreneurs, Pakistani entrepreneurs, uh, people from all over the world. And one reason why they they are successful is because they are just so scrappy. Their culture has has a, is a different f- philosophy around personal finances and being shrewd with your money and 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 not wasting money and investing money wisely. Where they can just they can come to America. And clean house, and you know, have have multiple businesses, multiple streams of revenue because they just worked their butt off and they made smarter decisions than than our culture generally ingrains in, into into our people. So, I think that's one of the things that's often not talked about enough. Before you start a business, take in, get your personal finances in the best shape they can be in, and be able to live off of macaroni and cheese, beans and rice 
for the first two or three years because that's what it's going to take. Absolutely, because I know as well how, how difficult it is as well if you do go into a different country and then you have to start building your business. It's not just about just finding your clients. You have to find uh, potential people who can open doors for you. You have to build your new network, network of friends, network of people who maybe have uh, same ideas, other entrepreneurs and so on. I did that the same as well in the UK. I had to first well find a place. And luckily enough, I had some uh, relations where I could stay the first two weeks or so. Right. But after that, I had to go and get my own place somewhere. <laughs> and from there, uh, from one of the rooms in that uh, house, I run my business. Uh, awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's how the things have to be done. It's, it's not always that you go and rent some office. Um, later on, of course, with my next business, and eventually I had them in the city center. I had a big, big office uh, with lots of space and lots of uh, desks and so on with potential for growth and so on. But that's the things that you have to adapt. It doesn't go from, from starting to just from zero to 100 within two days or something. Absolutely. And Warren, Warren yeah. Buffett calls it the snowball. That snowball is is very tiny in the beginning, but if you make the right mm -hmm. decisions, it, it grows and it compounds. You know, one of my favorite books is the biography of, of Warren Buffett, and he talks about uh, in the, in the early days of, of of his one of his first investment funds, he would go to New York and he would stay at the Waldorf Astoria, one of the finest hotels in New York City. But he would they, he would negotiate with the hotel owner to let him stay in the janitor closet for free. And, and, <laughs> and even at the time, Warren Buffett was successful. This, this was like, you know, 10 years into, into the story of Warren. But, but you just look at that one, what that story about a man who at the time probably had a $10 million investment fund, still, still hustling, still staying in the, in the, in the janitor closet because he knew that one of his philosophies is, is a hundred dollars today is not a hundred dollars. It's actually a thousand dollars because that's what I, that's what it'll grow to become. Using that philosophy of compound interest, understanding the value of, of, of cost savings and, and applying that into your business's growth and being patient and continually, continually repeating that cycle, to me, is one, of the, is one of the principles of business that causes success. Exactly. And that brings me actually to my, my third question that I've got here uh, for you, which is uh, with the current volatility that we've been speaking about that's happening now in the market, uh, businesses going out of business or consumers not spending money, people not sure whether they're still going to have a job next month, next week or so, and, and when events are going to open up again. There are many, many multiple industries that are dependent on each other so if one doesn't work the other one can't actually generate revenue because then the next can't and so on and so on it just becomes a whole chain reaction and so what do you see uh, brian what um is an ideal and, and really effective marketing strategy for small and medium-sized companies in the current situation that we are all uh, faced with yeah great question tough question i went through a similar situation in 2008, 9, 10 in the United States, we had the Great Recession. And it was very similar to the situation we're in now. I think the situation we're in now is, is more severe, but perhaps hopefully won't last as long. The Great Recession mm -hmm. was, just, was just like a winter time that, that this would not go away. It was three or four years of bad business. And what, 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 enabled my business to survive at the time. You know, I had 120 employees at the time and I didn't want to make any layoffs and, and I, my revenue was cut in half or by, by even at times 75% was, was just a, a relentless, monotical focus on taking the business into what I call cockroach mode, which means grooming the business to where it can survive anything. And that might mean that might mean making extreme cost-cutting measures. It could mean, at the time, I rallied my team of, of, of over 100 and, and asked everybody on the team to say, okay, listen, we're all going to have to work twice as hard for half the money to survive this. And if you're not willing to do that and you don't want to be a part of this journey together then, and you want to leave the team, that's fine. No hard feelings. And when times get better, we'll bring you back on. But literally, I'm going to have to ask each and every one of you to, to put in twice the amount of effort for literally half the money. And it's my, my goal not to have to lay off any of you. 
and we'll get through this together. And believe it or not, we'll look back and we'll be glad it happened and because it's going to make us a stronger company. We're going to come out of it uh, even better than we are now. And that's what got us through it. Now, the, the cuts may be deeper uh, this time around, but step one, mm-hmm. don't give up. Stay in the game. Figure out every available option to you to help your business survive. Because you, when you come out of this, you will have a stronger business. You yourself will be a stronger entrepreneur. You yourself will be a better business owner. And you'll actually, if you can survive it, you'll, make, you'll, you'll be even more prosperous on the back end of it because you'll have a better business and you'll have less competitors. So that's my advice is, is, to, is to really figure out how you're going to take your business in the, in the cockroach mode and, and how you're going to get back to fundamentals from a marketing perspective. It, it, the same the same concept of you're going to have to work twice as hard for half the money. What does that mean? That means that you as the business owner, you might have to work six or seven days a week for the next year to to hustle up the business it's going to take to, to keep everything afloat. It may mean that you're going to have to work twice as hard for every single customer and, th- and treat them twice as good as you did before. Every customer now is probably two or three or, or 10 times more valuable than they were six months ago. So that means you're going to have to outserve your competitors. It means you're just going to have to work harder to hold on to the clients you have and to get new clients. And 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 it, and, it's, and as simple as that sounds, it's hard to do. And the good news is, a lot of your competitors are not going to be willing to do it. Exactly, and that's what uh, takes them many out of the business because they are still maybe in the mindset that they believe. Uh, They can continue and they don't need to uh, change. Or, for instance, some business might think, okay, then we totally don't do anything. We, we cut advertising, we cut here, we cut there, and so on. Don't do anything. We quickly uh, take a sleeping pill and wait. But yeah, 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 yeah. It takes longer. Great and by point. the time you wake up, uh, your stomach is aching because uh, there's nothing left to great, great point. survive on. Let's go back to the circle of... of uh, Influence. Your circle of concern is there's no business. Mm. Circle of influence is okay. Let's just let's just say we own a I don't know a construction company and we do remodels for people's homes and nobody's calling right now. Well, mm. okay. What is in our what is in our circle of influence? Okay. Well, let's just say we can do free designs and evaluations and we'll literally put three or four hours into designing your new kitchen remodel for free when we used to charge for that and none of our competitors are doing that. And we spend $100 a week on Facebook ads to promote that. And so the one person in our market that's going to do this job this week, we actually get because we have a different, we have a different proposition than, than our competitors do. That's something that you, know, you have to think through the, those, those things that you can do inside of your circle of, of influence to, to work your way through this. And it, it's just more hustle, more work. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, you don't want to give that kind of stuff away, but you may have to in order to survive through this rather than just sitting back and waiting like you just said exactly and so i think it's just giving the value ahead because then eventually um, we will get the business that we'll get after this whole crisis is passed that's the dividend that we get for what we've put into the business into our clients heads and into their hands as well which uh, differentiates as well as absolutely from the competition who Uh, still not uh, willing to change, to adapt, to modernize, whether exactly. it's even small things, whether it's a website, whether it's the marketing content or or even just the way they, they do the pricing, the offers, or even just in improving the attitudes of their own people, investing in training people in that. That's, for instance, I've got one employee who's uh, now doing some uh, training for Microsoft certification for different things and that. And Yeah, he used to work for other companies as well before, but uh, he did courses, but they never said, hey, you can go and do the certification. There was never the money for exams. And when I think, well, come on, the Microsoft certifications are not that expensive. Uh, the exactly. certifications that are massively expensive, just look at SAP or anything like that. It's crazy what they charge. And the great thing about it is he can use the knowledge anyway. And it just helps him actually to, to showcase as well at a later time, whatever happens, that he's got uh, really good skills bes- besides his awesome degrees. But um, he has practical, usable knowledge and he can prove it. And it's not just that somebody says uh, he's good or he's great or whatever. Um, great point. You, you can use this time when it's slower to actually reinvest in your team. Exactly. To, to actually to actually level your team up. So when you come out of this, you've you've got a, a better team to offer to your clientele that 
you know, you might not have been able to make those investments when things were busy, but now you have the opportunity to do that. There's a million yeah, ways you can look at this as, a, as, as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the same thing is as well, but it's for the salespeople. They get sales trainings or for instance, uh, one decides, okay, let's maybe scrap this product and develop this and this new idea that we never had the time to and do it properly and use maybe the knowledge from other stuff that we've done before. And it becomes a totally new product that is actually fitting to today's needs and demands. Because exactly. uh, just look at it, for instance, many people are now moving, they have to work from home and they still don't have the time to mow their own lawn. Right. That's reality. Yeah. And you're busy just keeping your kids that they do their homework and so on and uh, fixing maybe your own stuff in your home, but uh, <laughs> yeah. mowing the lawn. Good heavens, that's even a limit what you can do. You don't have time for that. That's right. That's where yeah. we come in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I see it myself here as well. I'm, I'm lucky that I don't have to do it. That's why we've got somebody who does it for us. But uh, I wouldn't have time. Yep. It's just, it's different if you have a, maybe a nine to five job and you say, okay, uh, I don't have this crazy situation as we have now with all these COVID and all other lockdowns and so on. Um, just recently, I said to a friend, well, he told me that people were going nuts and collecting, uh, buying crazy toilet paper. And I <laughs> said, well, uh, hey, we even had a bakery around the corner. They made uh, cake looking like toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have the same silliness going on there that we do. Yeah, but it does. That stopped now. But it's uh, obviously now I thought it's going to be like the next thing would be masks or whatever. But yeah. Uh, Yeah, it's just crazy. But the in different regions are looking for different kind of stuff, and it's, it doesn't all really make much sense. We right. say, okay, they should invest more and, and putting the money somewhere else where it makes more more sense as well. But they're not really obviously willing to do that, but a few are willing, and they're doing their stuff. And and uh, as you see from other economy economical issues and other times where it's been difficult. Many great businesses have evolved there because the people had time and they thought, okay, what do I do? I can either watch uh, YouTube the whole day or I can do something productive right. for myself. Right. And, you know, to that point, it's not realistic to, to not allow yourself some balance. You know, you talk, about, you talk about YouTube. You know, I've had some more time on my hands uh, throughout all of this. And the deal I make with myself is for every hour of crappy TV that I watch, I have to watch an hour of something that that's going to benefit me, whether it be a podcast like this one or, or a class on masterclass or something on Udemy. I have to do one hour of, of personal development for every hour that I, that I watch of garbage. And that's something that just works for me, you know, to like, to, like you said, use this time to level up, to grow, you know, not only for your business, your team, but also you personally as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, You need to come out of this with some skills that you didn't have before. Exactly. That's, uh, that's what I do too as well. Like for instance, today uh, before I did this recording, I was uh, listening to three different podcasts, one included from Gary V's, interesting new ideas and so on. You suddenly get new ideas and you think, hey, wait a minute, I could do this and that. And hey, I, I used to do that as well. That's actually not that bad idea. Hey, I've got no time. Let's think, just revamp it. Yes. Put it into yes. a new, new grooming, new paint, new color, and then get it done. <laughs> that, is, that is time. That's high leverage. That is high leverage investing your time to where you miss exactly. an hour and you come out with so much more versus what you normally would have done with that hour. Exactly. So uh, let me please summarize what we've just uh, heard. So uh, you said you've done businesses in the traditional way, with, like with your first business, and then your, your current business is more a technology-driven business. And it's as well gone within six years from zero dollars to uh, 10, no, 20 million dollars in revenue without any outside funding. Because, of course, I see the same thing. It's, it's um, in a certain way risk averse because, of course, some banks and so on and lenders might not necessarily understand our business models. And you have then, in case something goes bad or, or like now we've got all these economic recessions, you know what you owe and what you can uh, carry. But if you are um, over in debt, then uh, you can crash very quickly and the light will go out before you even notice it. And that's the key thing, I think, in business as well. Absolutely. And as you said as well, uh, raising money, it's you have to really know what you're doing. And, and if you're not 
have done that. You haven't got good advisors who really know the game, who can really hold your hand and really show you that you don't really trip into the next landmine. Then otherwise you'll just uh, lose a lot of lifetime, money, and as well energy in that. And uh, investing the cash flow into the company that you're generating and what you're running makes much more sense. It needs, of course, to have a certain time where things are not as luxurious, you're not overspending um, your financial assets and that. Um, because we, we, we always have times where the economy goes ups and downs right. and uh, we have to have as well a certain kind of free space so that we can move and not suddenly get strangled by our own um, habits and uh, desires, especially in overspending, buying stuff that we don't really need at the time. And if things do, do really get bad, we have to be able to turn the business around, to revamp it, to um, cut as well, especially the costs that are really not necessary at a certain time, and even negotiate with our team to say, hey, let's all take a pay cut, let's work extra, get this through, and uh, we'll be better, stronger, and everybody in the long run will benefit because not only they have still a job, uh, six years later, but they actually haven't uh, taken a massive loss because all the people who are losing now the jobs, um, they will be the ones who are mostly going to lose in the long run compared to maybe a very few that even though they have lost the, their jobs, they are able to maybe start a business and say, okay, now I have really, I have to do that. Now I want to start my business because I haven't anyway any other opportunity other than do it now. That's a small group, and if you don't that, and you've already got uh, your business running, then it's really to to think how you can get your marketing working away. Of course, it'll be a lot of hustle, a lot of work, and uh, yeah, go the extra mile. Treat your clients uh, super super well, get them really happy, and just um, just go beyond what your competition usually will do and your clients will remember it and <laughs> they'll buy afterwards. They won't, they'll know they, they don't need to swip, swatch uh, and, and even if they switch to a different kind of competitor for a time, they'll come back because they say, oh, it wasn't that good. Exactly. <laughs> go back because I know here the grass is really greener and not, not just because it's been painted green. <laughs> as, as simple as those concepts sound, I think those are the ways to get through this crisis. Exactly. I see that too as well. So it was great having you here on the show, Brian. Um, yeah. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed sharing my thoughts. If, mm -hmm. if anybody uh, wants to reach me, they can email me at brian at yourgreenpal.com. If you're in the United States and you're listening to this and you need, you, you, you realize that your time is better spent uh, doing the things that you're good at rather than cutting your own lawn. Uh, you can jump on yourgreenpal.com or download GreenPal in the App Store and, and get some way to mow your grass for you in less than a minute. Great. Yeah, definitely. That's good to get rid of that hard work and then have somebody <laughs> else to do it who really knows how to do it and has got the right lawnmower and everything in proper shape and you don't have to afterwards clean your lawnmower. Exactly. The things let, that let you a, don't let a really like. Let a, you do exactly. what you're good at and let a pro handle the stuff that you're not good at. Absolutely.
So our next episode, what will it be about? It's about getting more focus in our day. Key topic, filter the noise of social media so that your energy is 100% devoted on your business. And there we will be looking at following three areas. Social media is a big distraction for entrepreneurs so that they need to cut out the noise. So you think, okay, what's it all about? Well, there's all this stuff happening in social media. So many people are posting garbage in our circles of influence and circles of friendships and business connections and so on. There's so much garbage going out. You're getting so much kind of offers that are actually distracting you, are wasting your time and energy. There are these guys who are saying it's a pandemic, we're all going to die. And then you've got other crazy nutcases who say, hey, buy my shit because otherwise uh, the business will go down. And next one trying to sell you stuff that isn't going to help you at all. You have to be focused on being essential. But you can't do that if you are everywhere and all the time you are getting distracted by all these garbage that's been posted on on sites like Facebook and Instagram, uh, this kind of area you should avoid because it just makes no sense. Um, just look at what the big top dogs are doing. They are not on Facebook. They are not on Instagram. They are on Maximum. On Twitter, that's it. That's totally enough. You don't need more. Because you think of it, it's 140 characters. Or 250 characters, depending on how much you actually want to use and try it and add pictures and everything. It is totally enough. All the other stuff is just distraction. The worst thing is, look at Facebook. You've got at the bottom of your app, in your phone, this little icon where you can watch videos. It can go endless. It's awesome because you actually can watch all the time in the evening if you are not bothered. You don't want to do anything and you want to just be distracted and waste your energy you can look at all this garbage that's in there it's it's crazy stuff it's it's crime it's war stuff it's all sorts of other garbage and and political fake news you've got all this stuff that's going and telling you oh the world is going to go under or horrible stuff where you say how can anyone even upload this whole garbage it's tasteless and uh, it's criminal um, you don't need this stuff in your mind and you definitely don't need to use that to waste your day because let's be fair if you are the hardworking guy who maybe gets at up six and then by 10 in the evening you've got your do day done you've had all your work you've done maybe some time even for family and other kind of stuff you've got to eat you have to eat something properly you need to have some exercise at the same time if you are wasting your energy and your time with garbage, you will get garbage in your business and your life. Topic number two. How can you get more focus in your day so you will generate business strength? Because now, at this time, we need to build strength. And it's not something that happens from today over tomorrow and it's done. It has to be continuous, a continuous action that needs to be focused. And if you're watching garbage, listening to garbage, following garbage gurus and other kind of bullshit, you are going to be eventually messed up, confused and totally going nuts. Going around the wrong corners and eventually getting beaten up. So our third topic, what do you need to focus the next 18 months? in your business so that it will continue to grow instead of being beaten up by haters and energy vampires. <laughs> You'd say energy vampires. Yes, it's not just the garbage that's being posted on social media, especially on, on, on Facebook and, and Instagram, this kind of stuff. It's just a lot of stuff. People are just messing up with people's emotions. And you might even be on whatsapp groups and, and wechat groups and these other kind of stuff where people are just vulching and 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 adding more negative news and negative energy and fearing this will go bad and this will go bad and this and things and you need to buy this then they'll tell you you need to buy crypto you need to buy uh, cryptocurrency next one say you have to buy stocks the other ones you have to buy property that nobody wants to buy and this and this and this shit 
don't do that kind of stuff. Keep out of that. Keep clean and focused. Because otherwise, these energy vampires, they'll go and try to live off your energy. And once they've had everything, they move on. Because for them, you are only essential as long as you've got energy they can take. And even if the energy might even be your money, your resources, your assets, yeah, they'll just try to take everything from you and then move on. And you want to avoid that. So that's the next episode's key content topic. It's filtering out the noise of social media so that your energy is 100% on your business and exactly in those areas that absolutely matter for, so that you grow in the next 18 months. Because that's super important in the current time. If you don't do these things, you eventually will go and sink your business instead of getting it to grow and fly high. Well, that's all for today's episode of The Growth Zone. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't got your signed copy of the marketing book, stop by on our website at book.prmediareach.com and hurry because the reserve batch of signed books are almost sold out. So, the address is Book PR Media Reach dot com. I'll repeat book dot PR Media Reach dot com. Mm -hmm.